A good evening, friends and neighbors and those who are lovers of God. We thank you, as always, for spending time with us this time as we study the Word of God. We've been looking at the book of Daniel, but Daniel is not simply a book. It's about a journey, and it tells the story of four young Hebrew boys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And one of the reasons we want to study this chapter is because in the first <clears throat> four chapters, these young men were tested. And right now, many of you who are watching me, you're being tested. You're being tested. You're, you're being tested emotionally. You're being tested spiritually, your faith in God. You're being tested psychologically, your relationship, your family. You're going to be tested financially. And so it is important, I think, for us, and God gave us this book, as we look at these three, four young men and see how they were tested. And remember from our study last week and the week before that they did not have a support system. It's one thing to be tested when you have someone to stand with you. But when it seems like you're all alone, all these four young men had were each other. And so... In chapter 1, they were tested with food, like a food test. Uh, they were being forced. The Babylonians tried to force them to eat food that was defiled. And the food was considered defiled because it was leftover food that had been, um, that, that had been uh, sacrificed to the Babylonian gods. And that was considered defiled food. And they passed that test. They passed that test. And in chapter 2, they were tested as far as trusting God with their future. And they passed that test. Now here we are in chapter 3. They're going to be faced with another test. And I want to just say with you, to you right now, that when you pass one test, God is strengthening you for another test. And he'll always bless you when you pass the test. You know... What, what Satan does, Satan wants to test us to destroy our faith. But what God does, God wants to test us, allow us to be tested in order to develop our faith. Satan wants us to be tested to draw us away from God. But the Lord allows tests to draw us closer to God. And every time these three, <clears throat> these four young men went through a test, through it all, they were drawn closer to God. And I just want to say to all of us as we're going through this pandemic, what this, this pandemic is not a surprise to God. It is not. I heard uh, some people in government, politicians saying they were surprised by this. They did not expect this. They thought things were going fine. They thought the economy was going to be fine. They did not expect it. They didn't know it was coming, but God did. And every test that you face in your life, you didn't know it was coming, but God knew it was coming. You say, well, preacher, what does that mean? That means that if you're a child of God, God will enable you. He will prepare you. He will give you everything you need to endure the test. If you're a child of God and you're tested now, however you're being tested, I'm saying to you, because that test is not a surprise to God, God has already given you what you need to survive, and not just survive the test, but to thrive during and afterwards. And let's watch this study, the story of these young men. And so we are now in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel, and I'll just read the first part in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other uh, pro provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image that he had set up. In verse 3, the Bible says they came. So the satraps and the perfects and the perfects, and the governors, and the advisors, and the treasurers, and the judges, and the magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then look at verse 4. Then the herald, that's 
the announcer loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of the gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. This is the setting for the third test. In this setting, I remember the Jews went to a place called Babylon. The king was Nebuchadnezzar. And it's interesting. At the end of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar was in a good place. Remember, as many other kings, he was arrogant. He had pride. He manipulated people. He used his position to hurt people. Well, at the end of Daniel chapter 2, it seemed as if he had changed. But in chapter 3, he reverted right back to his old self. He built this statue. The Bible said that the statue was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. 60 cubits high is about 90 feet. That is about the height of an 8 a 9 story building. That's real high. And it was made out overlaid with gold. The reason he built this statue is because in chapter 2, Daniel interpreted his dream, and his dream was about a statue. If you remember last week, the statue had four parts. It had a head of gold. And then Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, let me tell you what that means. You are the head of gold. Your kingdom represents, the Babylonian, the Babylonian kingdom represents that head of gold because it's a rich kingdom. It's a glorious kingdom. You have power. You have wealth. And then he went on down with the other parts of the, the dream uh, that Nebuchadnezzar saw, um, the statue that he saw in the dream. So Daniel described it, chapter 2. Well, Nebuchadnezzar said, hmm, if I dream about it, I might as well build it. So he built this statue in chapter 3 that he had dreamed about in chapter 2, except in chapter 2, only the head was made of gold. In chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar actually built it, he made the whole thing go. He took nearly all the gold that was available in Babylon, and he built it. But then he did something else, reverting back, because he was, he was insecure, he was prideful, he was arrogant. He said, I want everybody to bow down and worship this golden statue. That's where the problem came in. Now, the Bible said that everybody that he brought to this big conference, he brought all of his officials. For instance, in verse 2, the Bible says he brought the, the, the satraps. The, the satraps were like representatives of the people. Like we have the house of representatives. The uh, perfects were like the um, sheriffs, the people who were head of the police department, the sheriffs the, the uh, law enforcement officers. And then governors, you know who they are, like our governors. Advisors, <clears throat> the treasurers, the people who have the money, the judges, those who are people over the courts, and then the magistrates, that's what the people who assist the people who are over the courts. And he brought them from all over the country. That were w well over a thousand people here. And four of them were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In that crowd, the focus here is going to be on those three boys, though, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in the crowd. And here, I want to introduce you to a group of people I call the conformers. When they came before that, that statue, and Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody, he had his announcement, said, you better bow down. Never, everybody, thousands of government officials all got on their knees and they bowed down, except for Shadrach. Meshach, and Abednego. And the reason they didn't do it is because the Bible says worship only God. But if you see these people, nearly everybody else, they bow down because they were what I call the conformers. Let me just say something to you. Don't let the world uh, shape you into being a conformer. 
you don't have to do anything because everybody else is doing it, particularly if it is wrong. Listen, be you. You don't have to be like other people. Don't let the world pressure you into doing things that you don't want to do or violate your, com your, your conscience. You don't have to drink because everybody else drinks. You don't have to smoke because everybody else smokes. You don't have to do some things because everybody else is doing it. And, and these are over a thousand government officials bow down to a statue and worship it as God because they were doing what everybody else was doing. Do you. When I first became uh, the ministry at this church, I had uh, other leaders, and some of meant well, but um, I honestly believe that we will do what God has told us to do at this place at this time. And whatever ministry I have, I'm going to do what God has told me to do. But I remember early on, going back over 25 years ago now, that I had a few pull me to the side and say, well, Tim, you know, if y'all want to do some things, you need to do it this way. You need to do it that way. And I listened. I was never disrespectful because they all meant well. But in the back of my mind, I always said, I appreciate the advice. I'm glad things are working. And if we can do some things that other people do, great. But we do not have to conform to what everybody else is doing. We are told to conform ourselves into the image of God. And we've got to do what God has told us to do. And we are not going to do anything or not do anything simply because everybody else, every other church, or every other minister is doing it. Be you. You are unique. So these guys did it. And so you see the conformers. But then you see another group called the informers. The informers told on the people who would not conform. The informers told on the non-conformists. So look at the text. The Bible said that if, if you look at verse, chapter, verse 7, the Bible said that as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zipper, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of the, every language, they fell down and they worshiped the conformers. But then in verse 8, at this time, some astrologers, remember those guys from last week? They were like advisors who followed the stars, and they were advisors to Nebuchadnezzar, came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree, a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the music needs to fall down. And then they said in verse 12, but there are some Jews whom you, you set over the affairs of the province. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you. They actually were making this worse than that. That is not the context of what was going on. Uh, your majesty, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, these are what we call the informers. They, they um, informed the king, speaking against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, Sherry, Meshach, and Abednego is no way they were going to bow down and worship an image. The Bible says we should only worship God. Let me show you a couple of scriptures. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 10. And I'll show you that principle is all through the Bible. In Acts, chapter 10, uh, if you can recall the story, Peter, the first apostle, went to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and he was going to bring him into the church so the church would be Look, so the church would look like the world. God said, I want all races and nations in my family. And so here's the first non-Jew coming into the house of God. Peter went to him. When Peter entered his house, in verse 25 of Acts chapter 10, Cornelius recognized this was a man of God. And the Bible says, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence, an act of worship. Look at Peter's response. But Peter made him get up. He didn't ask him to get up. Peter made him get up and said, Stand up. I am only a man myself. Men should never worship men. Another passage is Revelations 22 and verse 8. Revelations 22 and verse 8. And you see John encountering, uh, he was on the island of Patmos, and an angel came. And gave him revelation. And it was glorious and it was wonderful. But look at uh, Revelation 22. And look at verse 8. 
I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, watch it, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. Somebody might say, well, we shouldn't worship men, but for sure, if an angel comes from heaven, we can worship an angel. Watch what the angel said in verse 9. But he said to me, John said, the angel told me while I was on my knees worshiping him, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll, worship God. That principle has been all through the Bible. We don't worship images. We don't worship people. We don't worship things. We don't worship angels. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship dead saints. We worship God because it is God who created you. It is God who sustains you. It is God who provides for you. It is God who protects you. It is God who saves your soul. It is God who will take you to death one day to heaven. It is God who will take care of you as you're going through this pandemic. You worship your creator. So the going back to Daniel chapter 3, the informers turned around and went to him and said, you got these young guys. Now, why did they do that? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, they were ungrateful. If you remember in chapter 2, Daniel, by interpreting the dream, actually saved the lives of these advisors. These astrologers were advisors to Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar was going to kill all of them because he's saying, you cannot tell me what I dreamed, and you can't interpret it. So Nebuchadnezzar said, you can't do it, I'm going to kill you. And then Daniel, in chapter 2, went to Nebuchadnezzar and said, I'm going to tell you what you dreamed, and I'm going to tell you what it means. So Daniel, along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had saved their lives, and they were ungrateful. Have you ever been hurt by someone who was ungrateful? Have you ever did good for somebody and they did bad to you? You helped them, but they hurt you. That's what was happening here. Ungratefulness. The second reason they did it, which is one of the main reasons, is these other advisors were jealous. Remember, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were young and they were outsiders. Here they are coming in and Nebuchadnezzar, the king, is relying on their advice and prom had promoted them. And they were jealous. They were jealous of their age, and they were jealous and resented the fact that they were of a different race. Has anybody ever resented you because of your gift? Has they resented you because of your age, your talent? That's what's happening here. So you have the conformers. Now the Bible said, though, when Nebuchadnezzar heard that. Verse 13, when he heard what they said, that these boys would not bow down, the Bible said he was furious. Look at verse 13 of, of Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought. He said, get me these boys. These are part of my advisors. I've been good to them. I've promoted them. You bring them to me. And he said, if you look at verse uh, 15, he says, now when you hear, he said, listen, listen. In fact, let me just start with verse 14. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods nor worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you don't fall down and worship the image, I may very good, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace of fire. Then what God will be able to rescue you? So we've looked at the conformers, the people who just say, I'm going to do what everybody else is doing. We've looked at the informers. Those are the people who tell on the non-conformists. And now we're looking at the transformers. Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow down, I will throw you in the fire. You either turn or burn. You better give in or you're going to be thrown in. Either lie. He said, even if you have to lie about not believing in God, either lie or die. And look at how these 
young men responded. Look at that response, verse 16, and I love this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. And listen, when the devil is attacking you or people saying things about you, I would just say to somebody, you don't have to defend yourself. God told Abraham, I'm your defense and your shield. you got to defend it. They say something ugly about you, you don't have to go get them straight and ball them out. Listen, you've got a defender in heaven. That's God. So they said, we don't have to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver from your majesty's hand. They said, number one, if you throw us in here, we got a God who has the power to deliver us. Affirm God's power. When you are tested, affirm God's power. Say what God can do. Now, some of you are here right, listening to me right now, and you are being tested financially. I am saying to you, speak a, a powerful confession. See, God doesn't want us to just think it. He wants us to say it. And God wants you to hear you say, God owns everything. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. If I'm waiting on the job, God will get me a job. I, 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 listen, God wants to hear you affirm that he takes care of you. They said, we have a God who can deliver us from the fire. Affirm God's power. If you're sick, say it. God can heal me. If you're wounded, say it. God will give me the power to forgive the person who hurt me. If you're raising children by yourself, you got to say it. God would not have given me these children if he would not provide for me, give me what I need to provide for these children. You've got to speak it. It's called confession. Literally, the word confess means to agree with God. God already said, and what confession is, is when you say what God has said. And God always takes care of his children. And if God, you're listening to me right now, and if God is taking care of you, you can put it in the comment line. You can say, God took care of me when I was sick. God took care of me when I, when I was grieving. God took care of me when I had to uh, raise some children alone. God took care of me when I was trying to take care of a sick mother or a sick father. If God, if God has taken care of you, won't you just comment, comment right now? Say it. Type it. Put it in there. God is able. But look what else they say. Verse 18, and here is the highest level of faith. They said in verse 17, God can deliver us. But then in verse 18, but even if he does not, we want you to know, King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I love this. They're saying God is able. But you know what? Our trust in him is not based on the fact as to whether he answers our particular request. We don't just trust in what he does. We trust in who he is. That even if he doesn't deliver us, we will obey him. Though we perish, yet we're going to serve him. And the highest level of faith is not trusting God every time he comes through because we follow a particular formula. Can you trust God when God doesn't follow the formula. The formula is, I love you, I trust you, I'm going to give, I'm going to do what's right. Therefore, the formula is, God, you're going to bless me. But what happens when God doesn't follow the formula? They're saying, he will, he will, we will not bow down. And the Bible says, and you know the rest of the story, that he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to time up. He said, I'm going to throw you in. And threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 20, in the fiery furnace. And then after a while, the Bible says the king looked into the furnace. And they were tied up, by the way, while they were being thrown in. The Bible says in verse 24, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked advisors, Want, we, want that three men that we tied up and threw in the fire? They said, Certainly, your majesty. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar looked in that fire and he didn't see three men. He saw four men walking around in the fire. And the fire was so hot. The Bible says that in verse 29, the men who threw them in the fire got burned up. And listen, you don't have to worry about getting burned up. 
You know who's gonna get uh, uh, get burned up? Get burned? The people who throw you in the fire. And the Bible said, he said, look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed. And he said, and the fourth one looks like the son of God. I want to just leave uh, just a, a couple of thoughts with you. Why does God <clears throat> let us go through the fire? Number one, God tests, let us be tested because he wants people to look at us. Notice the Bible said in verse 25, when they were in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar looked at him. Sometimes God wants people to look at us. So when they see us, they see God's work. You may be going through a difficult time with your finances, with sickness. It may be that God wants you to be an example to other people so that they'll know, even though I'm being tested, I'm going to still trust God. Also, he wants people to look at you so that they will know that if God can take care of you in the fire, God can take care of them when they go through their test. So sometimes we go through the fire because God wants people to look at us. Jesus said, "You're a light that shine, a light that a light that shines on a like a bright like a city." And P God wants people to see your light. The second thing is, He throws us in the fire. He allows us to go through the fire. Is He wants to liberate us? Look at verse 25. After they looked and saw them, the Bible says they were unbound. When they went in the fire, they were tied up. And sometimes God allows us to go into the the, the, the fire because there's some things in our lives he wants to loose. He wants to win bondage with thoughts and addictions. And sometimes God has got to send us through a fire. And the fire is a difficult place, a stressful place, a place that seemingly looks of lack. And God said, I'll send you through that place because I want to free you from something. Sometimes God wants to <clears throat> free us from jealousy from, from uh, anger, from um, prioritizing possessions over people, putting money before people. He wants to loose you. There's some things he wants to free you from, and he can't do it unless he sends you through a difficult place. So God sends us through difficult places so people can look at us, and when they look at us, they can see God. And then secondly, God wants to liberate us. And sometimes there are some addictions and some things that God wants to loose us from. And then lastly, <clears throat> God sends us through the fire because he wants to lift us. Look at verse 30. Then the king, once he saw God through the person of Jesus Christ, I believe that first person in the fire was Jesus. He came in to be with his, his children. The Bible says when they came out of the fire, in verse 27, the Bible says they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor their hair on their heads with sins, nor the wrong. Listen, you, can, you don't have to look like what you've been through. You don't have to look like you've been through the fire. You don't have to smell like smoke. That's the kind of God we serve. You've been through a bitter experience, but you're not a bitter person. You've been through a discouraging experience, but you are not a discouraged person. The fire didn't damage you. The Bible said when Nebuchadnezzar saw that, the Bible said in verse 30, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Listen, friend. When you come out of what you're going through, God is going to lift you up. He's going to promote you. He's going to take your business to another level. He's going to take your faith to another level. He's going to, he's going to take your relationship to another level. God sends us, allows us to go through the fire because he wants people to look at us and see him. He wants to, people to look at us. He wants to liberate us. And then lastly, he wants to lift us. Friend, if you hold on, just hold on. God will lift you up. God takes care of his children. What a powerful story of that these three young men left for us on how if you hold on and trust God, no matter what the situation is, God will take care of you.
We're going to pray right now, and if you have a prayer request, we ask that you enter the prayer request in. We had so many of you last week that we really appreciate that, that uh, who entered in those prayers. In fact, I got some praise reports, too. I got some reports back from people who said God asked them a prayer, God came through, and boy, we just had a hallelujah time, um, just, just, just really uh, hearing from you that God takes care of his children. So right now, if you would like to enter your prayer request, just enter it in, and I'll do what we did last week. After class, I will take and go and look at the comments and the prayer request, and then I will pray a pastor's prayer, a shepherd's prayer, over your request. Jesus said, if in two of you are in agreement, so you put in your request, and I'm going to be in agreement with you that God will open up the windows of heaven and rain down a blessing that you can't receive. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Father, we just thank you for being God all by yourself. And we thank you for the example of three these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Father, they, they didn't have a mother or father to stand by their side. They, they didn't have a church to go to. Father, they didn't have access to all the support systems that we have now. Yet, they stood firm in their faith. And I'm praying for somebody right now, Father, who feels all alone. Who feels like there is no support system for me. I have nobody to stand by me and with me. But Father, help that person to realize that they are not alone. That the Holy Spirit is with them and in them and will take care of them. That when we are children of God, we are never, ever alone. And our support system is the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as we go through the fire, somebody right now, God, somebody right now is going through the fire. That fire is a stressful situation, a worrying situation, a seemingly discouraging situation. Help them to realize what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 43. You told Isaiah to tell the people that they are mine. I formed them. I shaped them. And when they go through the waters, it will not drown them. And when we go through the fire, it will not send you us because you are mine. And so, Father, that's the promise that you made to us, that we are yours, and no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And we stand on that word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, friend.